This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti-Federalist Papers Anti-Federalist No. 20 Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican Letter No. 18 January 25, 1788 Dear Sir, I am persuaded a federal head never was formed that possessed half the powers which it could carry into full effect, altogether independently of the state or local governments, as the one the convention has proposed will possess. Should the state legislatures never meet, except merely for choosing federal senators and appointing electors, once in four and six years, the federal head may go on for ages to make all laws relative to the following subjects, and by its own courts, officers, and provisions, carry them into full effect, and to any extent it may deem for the general welfare. That is, for raising taxes, borrowing and coining monies, and for applying them, for forming and governing armies and navies, and for directing their operations, for regulating commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, for regulating bankruptcies, weights and measures, post offices and post roads, and captures on land and water, for establishing a uniform rule of naturalization, and for promoting the progress of science and useful arts, for defining and punishing piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, the offenses of counterfeiting, the securities and current coin of the United States, and offenses against the law of nations, and for regulating all maritime concerns, for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, the respective states training them and appointing the officers, for calling them forth when wanted, and for governing them when in the service of the Union, for the sole and exclusive government of a federal city or town, not exceeding ten miles square, and of places ceded for forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, for granting letters of mark and reprisal, and making war, for regulating the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives, for making and concluding all treaties and carrying them into execution, for judiciously deciding all questions arising on the Constitution, laws, and treaties of the Union, in law and equity, and questions arising on state laws also, where ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, where the United States, individual states, or a state where citizens of different states, and where foreign states or a foreign subject are parties or party, for impeaching and trying federal officers, for deciding on elections, and for expelling members, etc. All these enumerated powers we must examine and contemplate in all their extent in various branches, and then reflect that federal head will have full power to make all laws whatever respecting them and for carrying into full effect all powers vested in the Union, in any department or offices of it, by the Constitution, in order to see the full extent of the federal powers which will be supreme, and exercised by that head at pleasure, conforming to the few limitations mentioned in the Constitution. Indeed, I conceive, it is impossible to see them in their full extent at present. We see vast, undefined powers lodged in a weak organization, but cannot, by the inquiries of months and years, clearly discern them in all their numerous branches. These powers in feeble hands must be tempting objects for ambition and a love of power and fame. But, say the advocates, they are all necessary for forming an energetic federal government, all necessary in the hands of the Union, for the common defense and general welfare. In these great points they appear to me to go from the end to the means, and from the means to the end, perpetually begging the question. I think in the course of these letters I shall sufficiently prove that some of these powers need not be lodged in the hands of the Union, that others ought to be exercised under better checks, and in part by the agency of the States. Some I have already considered, some in my mind are not liable to objections, and the others I shall briefly notice in this closing letter. The power to control the military forces of the country, as well as the revenues of it, requires serious attention. Here again I must premise that a federal republic is a compound system, made up of constituent parts, each essential to the whole. We must then expect the real friends of such a system will always be very anxious for the security and preservation of each part, and to this end, 
that each constitutionally possess its natural portion of power and influence, and that it will constantly be an object of concern to them to see one part armed at all points by the Constitution, and in a manner destructive in the end, even of its own existence, and the others left constitutionally defenseless. The military forces of a free country may be considered under three general descriptions. One, the militia, two, the navy, and three, the regular troops, and the whole ought ever to be, and understood to be, in strict subordination to the civil authority, and that regular troops and select corps ought not to be kept up without evident necessity. Stipulations in the Constitution to this effect are perhaps too general to be of much service, except merely to impress on the minds of the people, and soldiery, that the military ought ever to be subject to the civil authority, etc. But particular attention, and many more definite stipulations, are highly necessary to render the military safe, and yet useful in a free government. And in a federal republic, where the people meet in distinct assemblies, many stipulations are necessary to keep apart from transgressing, which would be unnecessary checks against the whole met in one legislature, in one entire government. A militia, when properly formed, are in fact the people themselves, and render regular troops in a great measure unnecessary. The powers to form and arm the militia, to appoint their officers, and to command their services, are very important, nor ought they, in a confederated republic, to be lodged solely in any one member of the government. First, the Constitution ought to secure a genuine and guard against a select militia by providing that the militia shall always be kept well organized, armed, and disciplined, and include, according to the past and general usage of the States, all men capable of bearing arms, and that all regulations tending to render this general militia useless and defenseless by establishing select corps of militia or distinct bodies of military men not having permanent interests and attachments in the community to be avoided. I am persuaded I need not multiply words to convince you of the value and solidity of this principle, as it respects general liberty, and the duration of a free and mild government. Having this principle well fixed by the Constitution, then the federal head may prescribe a general uniform plan on which the respective states shall form and train the militia, appoint their officers, and solely manage them, except when called into the service of the Union, and when called into that service they may be commanded and governed by the Union. This arrangement combines energy and safety in it. It places the sword in the hands of the solid interests of the community, and not in the hands of men destitute of property, of principles, or of attachment to the society and government, who often form the select corps of peace or ordinary establishment. By it the militia are the people, immediately under the management of the state governments, but on a uniform federal plan, and called into service, command, and government of the Union, when necessary for the common defense and general tranquility. But, say gentlemen, the general militia are for the most part employed at home in their private concerns, cannot well be called out, or be depended upon, that we must have a select militia, that is, as I understand it, particular corps or bodies of young men, and of men who have but little to do at home, particularly armed and disciplined in some measure at the public expense, and always ready to take the field. These corps, not much unlike regular troops, will ever produce an inattention to the general militia, and the consequence has ever been, and always must be, that the substantial men, having families and property, will generally be without arms, without knowing the use of them, and defenseless, whereas to preserve liberty it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms, and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. Nor does it follow from this that all promiscuously must go into actual service on every occasion. The mind that aims at a select militia must be influenced by a truly anti-republican principle, and when we see many men disposed to practice upon it, whenever they can prevail, no wonder true republicans are for carefully guarding against it. As a farther check, it may be proper to add that the militia of any state shall not remain in the service of the Union, beyond a given period, without the express consent of the state legislature. As to the Navy, I do not see that it can have any connection with the local governments. 
the want of employment for it and the want of monies in the hands of the union must be its proper limitation the laws for building or increasing it as all the important laws mentioned in a former letter touching military and money matters may be checked by requiring the attendance of a large proportion of the representatives and the consent of a large proportion of those present to pass them as before mentioned by article one section eight congress shall have power to provide for organizing arming and disciplining the militia power to provide for does this imply any more than power to prescribe a general uniform plan and must not the respective states pass laws but in conformity to the plan for forming and training the militia in the present state of mankind and of conducting war the government of every nation must have power to raise and keep up regular troops the question is how shall this power be lodged in an entire government as in great britain where the people assemble by their representatives in one legislature there is no difficulty it is of course properly lodged in that legislature but in a confederated republic where the organization consists of a federal head and local governments there is no one part in which it can be solely and safely lodged by article one section eight congress shall have power to raise and support armies by article one section ten no state without the consent of congress shall keep troops or ships of war in time of peace it seems fit the union should direct the raising of troops and the union may do it in two ways by requisitions on the states or by direct taxes the first is most conformable to the federal plan and safest and it may be improved by giving the union power by its own laws and officers to raise the state's quota that may neglect and to charge it with the expense and by giving a fixed quorum of the state legislatures power to disapprove the requisition there would be less danger in this power to raise troops could the state governments keep a proper control over the purse and over the militia but after all the precautions we can take without evidently fettering the union too much we must give a large accumulation of powers to it in these and in other respects there is one check which i think may be added with great propriety that is no land forces shall be kept up but by legislative acts annually passed by congress and no appropriation of monies for their support shall be for a longer term than one year this is the constitutional practice in great britain and the reasons for such checks in the united states appear to be much stronger we may also require that these acts be passed by a special majority as before mentioned there is another mode still more guarded and which seems to be founded in the true spirit of a federal system it seems proper to divide those powers we can with safety lodge them in no one member of the government alone yet substantially to preserve their use and to ensure duration to the government by modifying the exercise of them it is to empower congress to raise troops by direct levies not exceeding a given number say two thousand in time of peace and twelve thousand in a time of war and for such troops as may be wanted to raise them by requisitions qualified as before mentioned by the above recited clause no state shall keep troops etc in time of peace this clearly implies it may do it in time of war this must be on the principle that the union cannot defend all parts of the republic and suggests an idea very repugnant to the general tendency of the system proposed which is to disarm the state governments a state in a long war may collect forces sufficient to take the field against the neighboring states this clause was copied from the confederation in which it was of more importance than in the plan proposed because under this the separate states probably will have but small revenues by article one section eight congress shall have power to establish uniform laws on the subjects of bankruptcies throughout the united states it is to be observed that the separate states have ever been in possession of the power and in the use of it of making bankrupt laws militia laws and laws in some other cases respecting which the new constitution when adopted will give the union power to legislate but no words are used by the constitution to exclude the jurisdiction of the several states and whether they will be excluded or not or whether they and the union will have concurrent jurisdiction or not must be determined by inference and from the nature of the subject if the power for instance to make uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies is in its nature indivisible 
or incapable of being exercised by two legislatures independently, or by one in aid of the other, then the states are excluded, and cannot legislate at all on the subject, even though the Union should neglect or find it impracticable to establish uniform bankrupt laws. How far the Union will find it practicable to do this, time only can fully determine. When we consider the extent of the country, and the very different ideas of the different parts of it, respecting credit, and the mode of making men's property liable for paying their debts, we may, I think, with some degree of certainty, conclude that the Union never will be able to establish such laws. But if practicable, it does not appear to me, on further reflection, that the Union ought to have the power. It does not appear to me to be a power properly incidental to a federal head, and I believe no one ever possessed it. It is a power that will immediately and extensively interfere with the internal police of the separate states, especially with their administering justice among their own citizens. By giving this power to the Union we greatly extend the jurisdiction of the federal judiciary, as all questions arising on bankrupt laws, being laws of the Union, even between citizens of the same state, may be tried in the federal courts. And I think it may be shown that by the help of these laws, actions between citizens of different states, and the laws of the federal city, aided by no overstrained judicial fictions, almost all civil causes may be drawn into those courts. We must be sensible how cautious we ought to be in extending unnecessarily the jurisdiction of those courts for reasons I need not repeat. This article of power, too, will considerably increase in the hands of the Union an accumulation of powers, some of a federal and some of an unfederal nature, too large without it. The Constitution provides that Congress shall have the sole and exclusive government of what is called the federal city, a place not exceeding ten miles square, and of all places ceded for forts, dockyards, etc., I believe this is a novel kind of provision in a federal republic. It is repugnant to the spirit of such a government, and must be founded in an apprehension of a hostile disposition between the federal head and the state governments. And it is not improbable that the sudden retreat of Congress from Philadelphia first gave rise to it. With this apprehension we provide the government of the Union shall have secluded places, cities, and castles of defense which no state laws whatever shall invade. When we attentively examine this provision in all its consequences, it opens to view scenes almost without bounds. A federal, or rather a national city, ten miles square, containing a hundred square miles, is about four times as large as London, and for forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, Congress may possess a number of places or towns in each state. It is true Congress cannot have them unless the state legislatures cede them, but when once ceded they can never be recovered, and though the general temper of the legislatures may be averse to such sessions, yet many opportunities and advantages may be taken of particular times and circumstances of complying assemblies, and particular parties, to obtain them. It is not improbable that some considerable towns or places, in some intemperate moments, or influenced by anti-republican principles, will petition to be seated for the purposes mentioned in the provision. There are men, and even towns, in the best republics, which are often fond of withdrawing from the government of them, whenever occasions shall present. The case is still stronger if the provision in question holds out allurements to attempt to withdraw the people of a state must ever be subject to the state as well as federal taxes, but the federal city and places will be subject only to the latter, and to them by no fixed proportions, nor of the taxes raised in them can the separate states demand any account of Congress. These doors, opened for withdrawing from the state governments entirely, may on other accounts be very alluring and pleasing to those anti-republican men who prefer a place under the wings of courts. If a federal town be necessary for the residence of Congress and the public officers, it ought to be a small one, and the government of it fixed on republican and common law principles, carefully enumerated and established by the Constitution. It is true the states, when they shall cede places, may stipulate that the laws of government of Congress in them shall always be formed on such principles. 
but it is easy to discern that the stipulations of a state or the inhabitants of the place seated can be of but little avail against the power and gradual encroachments of the union the principles ought to be established by the federal constitution to which all the states are parties but in no event can there be any need of so large a city and places for forts etc totally exempted from the laws and jurisdictions of the state governments if i understand the constitution the laws of congress constitutionally made will have complete and supreme jurisdiction to all federal purposes on every inch of ground in the united states and exclusive jurisdiction on the high seas and this by the highest authority the consent of the people suppose ten acres at west point shall be used as a fort of the union or a seaport town as a dockyard the laws of the union in those places respecting the navy forces of the union and all federal objects must prevail be noticed by all judges and officers and executed accordingly and i can discern no one reason for excluding from these places the operation of state laws as to mere state purposes for instance for the collection of state taxes in them recovering debts deciding questions of property arising within them on state laws punishing by state laws theft trespass and offences committed in them by mere citizens against the state laws the city and all the places in which the union shall have this exclusive jurisdiction will be immediately under one government that of the federal head and be no part of any state and consequently no part of the united states the inhabitants of the federal city and places will be as much exempt from the laws and control of the state governments as the people of canada or nova scotia will be neither the laws of the states respecting taxes the militia crimes or property will extend to them nor is there a single stipulation in the constitution that the inhabitants of this city and these places shall be governed by laws founded on principles of freedom all questions civil and criminal arising on the laws of these places which must be the laws of congress must be decided in the federal courts and also all questions that may by such judicial fictions as these courts may consider reasonable be supposed to arise within this city or any of these places may be brought into these courts and by a very common legal fiction any personal contract may be supposed to have been made in any place a contract made in georgia may be supposed to have been made in the federal city in pennsylvania the courts will admit the fiction and not in these cases make it a serious question where it was in fact made every suit in which an inhabitant of a federal district may be a party of course may be instituted in the federal courts also every suit in which it may be alleged and not denied that a party in it is an inhabitant of such a district also every suit to which a foreign state or subject the union a state citizens of different states in fact or by reasonable legal fictions may be a party or parties and thus by means of bankrupt laws federal districts etc almost all judicial business i apprehend may be carried into the federal courts without essentially departing from the usual course of judicial proceedings the courts in great britain have acquired their powers and extended very greatly their jurisdictions by such fictions and suppositions as i have mentioned the constitution in these points certainly involves it in principles and almost hidden cases which may unfold and in time exhibit consequences we hardly think of the power of naturalization when viewed in connection with the judicial powers and cases is in my mind a very doubtful extent by the constitution itself the citizens of each state will be naturalized citizens of every state to the general purposes of instituting suits claiming the benefits of the laws etc and in order to give the federal courts jurisdiction of an action between citizens of the same state in common acceptance may not a court allow the plaintiff to say he is a citizen of one state and the defendant a citizen of another without carrying legal fictions so far by any means as they have been carried by the courts of king's bench and exchequer in order to bring causes within their cognizance further the federal city and districts will be totally distinct from any state and a citizen of a state will not of course be a subject of any of them and to avail himself of the privileges and immunities of them must he not be naturalized by congress in them and may not congress make any proportion of the citizens of the states naturalized subjects of the federal city and districts and thereby entitle them to sue or defend in all cases in the federal courts i have my doubts and many sensible men i find have their doubts on these points 
and we ought to observe they must be settled in the courts of law by their rules, distinctions, and fictions. To avoid many of these intricacies and difficulties, and to avoid the undue and unnecessary extension of the federal judicial powers, it appears to me that no federal districts ought to be allowed, and no federal city or town, except perhaps a small town, in which the government shall be republican, but in which Congress shall have no jurisdiction over the inhabitants, but in common with the other inhabitants of the states. Can the Union want in such a town anything more than a right to the soil on which it may set its buildings, an extensive jurisdiction over the federal buildings, and property, its own members, officers, and servants in it? As to all federal objects, the Union will have complete jurisdiction over them, of course anywhere and everywhere. I still think that no actions ought to be allowed to be brought in the federal courts between citizens of different states, at least unless the cause be of very considerable importance, that no action against a state government by any citizen or foreigner ought to be allowed, and no action in which a foreign subject is party, at least, unless it be of very considerable importance, ought to be instituted in the federal courts. I confess I can see no reason whatever for a foreigner or for citizens of different states carrying sixpenny causes into the federal courts. I think the state courts will be found by experience to be bottomed on better principles, and to administer justice better than the federal courts. The difficulties and dangers I have supposed will result from so large a federal city and federal districts, from the extension of the federal judicial powers, etc., are not, I conceive, merely possible, but probable. I think pernicious political consequences will follow from them, and from the federal city especially, for very obvious reasons, a few of which I will mention. We must observe that the citizens of a state will be subject to state as well as federal taxes, and inhabitants of the federal city and districts only to such taxes as Congress may lay. We are not to suppose all our people are attached to free government, and the principles of the common law but that many thousands of them will prefer a city governed not on republican principles. This city and the government of it must indubitably take their tone from the characters of the men who from the nature of its situation and institution must collect there. This city will not be established for productive labor, for mercantile or mechanic industry, but for the residence of government, its officers and attendants. If hereafter it should ever become a place of trade and industry in the early periods of its existence, when its laws and government must receive their fixed tone, it must be a mere court, with its appendages, the executive, congress, the law courts, gentlemen of fortune and pleasure, with all the officers, attendants, suitors, expectants, and dependents on the whole, however brilliant and honorable this collection may be, if we expect it will have any sincere attachments to simple and frugal republicanism, to that liberty and mild government which is dear to the laborious part of a free people, we most assuredly deceive ourselves. This early collection will draw to it men from all parts of the country of a like political description. We see them looking towards the place already. Such a city or town containing a hundred square miles must soon be the great, the visible, and dazzling center, the mistress of fashions, and the fountain of politics. There may be a free or shackled press in this city, and the streams which may issue from it may overflow the country, and they will be poisonous or pure as the fountain may be corrupt or not. But not to dwell on a subject that must give pain to the virtuous friends of freedom, I will only add, can a free and enlightened people create a common head so extensive, so prone to corruption and slavery, as this city probably will be, when they have it in their power to form one pure and chaste, frugal and republican? Under the Confederation, Congress has no power whereby to govern its own officers and servants. A federal town in which Congress might have special jurisdiction might be expedient, but under the new Constitution, without a federal town, Congress will have all necessary powers, of course, over its officers and servants. Indeed, it will have a complete system of powers to all the federal purposes mentioned in the Constitution, so that the reason for a federal town under the Confederation will by no means exist under the Constitution. Even if a trial by jury should be admitted in the federal city, what man, with any state attachments or republican virtue about him, will submit to be tried by a jury of it? I might observe more particularly upon several other parts of the Constitution proposed, but it has been uniformly my object in examining a subject so extensive and difficult in many parts to be illustrated, to avoid unimportant things, and not to dwell upon points not very material. The rule for apportioning requisitions on the states, having some time since been agreed to by eleven states, I have viewed as settled. 
The stipulation that Congress, after twenty-one years, may prohibit the importation of slaves is a point gained, if not so favorable as could be wished for. As monopolies in trade, perhaps, can in no case be useful, it might not be amiss to provide expressly against them. I wish the power to retrieve and pardon was more cautiously lodged, and under some, lim and under some limitations. I do not see why Congress should be allowed to consent that a person may accept a present, office, or title of a foreign prince, etc. As to the state governments, as well as the federal, are essential parts of the system, why should not the oath taken by officers be expressly to support the whole? As to debts due and from the Union, I think the Constitution intends, on examining Article 4, Section 8, and Article 6, that they shall stand on the same ground under the Constitution as under the Confederation. In the article respecting amendments, it is stipulated that no state shall ever be deprived of its equal vote in the Senate without its consent, and that alternatives may be made by the consent of three-fourths of the states. Stipulations to bind the majority of the people may serve one purpose, to prevent frequent motions for change, but these attempts to bind the majority generally give occasion for breach of contract. The states all agreed about seven years ago that the Confederation should remain unaltered unless every state should agree to alterations but we now see it agreed by the convention and four states that the old confederacy shall be destroyed and a new one of nine states be erected if only nine shall come in had we agreed that a majority should alter the confederation a majority's agreeing would have bound the rest but now we must break the old league unless all the states agree to alter or not to proceed with adopting the constitution whether the adoption by nine states will not produce a nearly equal and dangerous division of the people for and against the constitution and whether the circumstances of the country were such as to justify the hazarding a probability of such a situation, I shall not undertake to determine. I shall leave it to be determined hereafter whether nine states, under a new federal compact, can claim the benefits of any treaties made with the Confederation of Thirteen, under a distinct compact and form of existence, whether the new Confederacy can recover debts due to the old Confederacy, or the arrears of taxes due from the states excluded. It has been well observed that our country is extensive and has no external enemies to press the parts together, that therefore their union must depend on strong internal ties. I differ with the gentlemen who make these observations only in this. They hold the ties ought to be strengthened by a considerable degree of internal consolidation, and my object is to form them and strengthen them on pure federal principles. Whatever may be the fate of many valuable and necessary amendments in the Constitution proposed, the ample discussion and respectable opposition it will receive will have a good effect. They will operate to produce a mild and prudent administration, and to put the wheels of the whole system in motion on proper principles. They will evince that true Republican principles and attachments are still alive and formidable in this country. These, in view, I believe, even men quite disposed to make a bad use of the system, will long hesitate before they will resolve to do it. A majority from a view of our situation, and influenced by many considerations, may acquiesce in the adoption of this Constitution. But it is evident that a very great majority of the people of the United States think it, in many parts, an unnecessary and unadvisable departure from true Republican and Federal principles. Yours, the Federal Farmer. End of Anti-Federalist Section 20